So in this video, we're going to draw out the MOSFET full band diagram, the complete band diagram, with the vacuum level, band bending, everything. And how are we going to do that? Well, we said in the last video that the Fermi level, EF, must be constant. Uh, it must be constant within a system in equilibrium. So we're going to start out in drawing our band diagram by just drawing EF as a straight line. So this is EF. Um, and we know that it's split into three different regions, which I'm going to just delineate by vertical lines. Let's make it vertical dashed lines. We know that we've got our semiconductor here. We've got our oxide in the middle. And we've got our metal over here. OK, so uh, let's first draw the band diagrams each independently and then figure out how to merge them together. So in the semiconductor, if we just draw our band diagrams completely ignorant of everything, uh, we, let's say that this is a p-type material. So let's draw the conduction band, the intrinsic Fermi energy, and the valence band. And lastly, let's draw the vacuum level, E0. Um, okay, and then for the oxide, we've got our we've got our vacuum level E naught. We've got the conduction band, which is much closer uh, to the vacuum level than with the silicon, and the reason for that is the electron affinity. Um, so, chi is the symbol that we use for that. So this is the chi of the oxide or electron affinity of the oxide. Let me just uh, erase erase this uh, statement so that we, we have more, more room to work. And then for the metal, the, we know the work function and why there's a difference between work function and electron affinity. They're talking about exactly the same concept. Uh, it's just that one was discovered, they were discovered separately. So unfortunately, they've got different names, but they're referring to the same thing. Uh, so phi m is the work function of the metal. And this is the, the vacuum level. So one thing, the only thing we need in order to figure out how to combine this, or the first thing that we need, is that the vacuum level, E0, must be continuous. And the reason for this we can illustrate below. If we've got, uh, let's say we've just got a system. It's a block of three materials. First one's a metal, next one's a, an oxide, Third's one's a, third one is a semiconductor. And so these are just you know blocks of material. If we've got an electron, let's say it's floating above the metal, and let's say it has an energy just barely above, uh, just barely above um, the vacuum level of the metal. So we can draw the band diagram equivalent for this by saying that the electron or the the vacuum level of the metal is here and the electron is right right here it's it's got an energy barely above the metal and so what if the electron hops over here to be just barely above the oxide physically in space uh, the electron should still be free so as the electron moves um, the energy band the vacuum level e naught cannot be discontinuous. So if the electron just physically in space goes from being above the metal to being above the oxide, the electron still has to be free. And if it were below the vacuum level, it would be a bound electron. So the vacuum level, it can move around, but it has to be continuous at the interface of two materials. It has to be continuous everywhere. And you can make a similar argument using conservation of energy. But that's the basic idea. Electron, the vacuum level must be continuous. And so we need to figure out how to connect the vacuum level of these three materials. Well, how do we do that for silicon? So we know that the, for, for silicon, 
One way for this to happen is by the band bending down towards the oxide. Or in other words, physically what's happening, we have some holes that were at the interface and they're vacating this place. They're vacating the interface between the, or the, the part of the semiconductor that's near the oxide. And they're leaving behind negatively charged acceptor ions. And this causes the depletion region to be formed and the band bends downward toward the oxide. So this is the physical consequence of energy conservation or the physical consequence of um, the vacuum level needing to be continuous. So this is how we draw it. And because the position, so this is the x direction, because the position within the semiconductor shouldn't matter as to how hard it is to ionize uh, an electron, this distance, this distance from the conduction band to the vacuum level must also be constant. So the conduction band has to bend down with the, with the vacuum level. And so all these bands bend downward towards the vacuum or towards the, uh, with, with the vacuum level. So now what about the oxide? Uh, how, how does the, how's the oxide band affected by this? Well, what is the oxide? Um, if we physically draw this out, we know we've got uh, we've got a metal. So this is our metal. This is our oxide. And this is our bulk semiconductor. So this is a p-type semiconductor. And we said that we've got a bunch of negative charges now, a bunch of depletion, a depletion region below the oxide. And no charges can flow within the oxide, but we've got this metal above. We've got this metal right here. And if we've got negative charges very close to a metal, we expect some positive charge to be induced on the metal. That's just because charges are free to move, move around however they want it within the metal. And they will do so so as to cancel out the electric field within the metal. That's just your, your basic physics. And so we'll get an electric field uh, this electric field within the oxide. So the oxide is effectively acting like a capacitor. So if we've got a bunch of negative, a bunch of positive charges here and negative charges here, and there's a large electric field, or there's some electric field within the oxide. So there's the oxide, this is the metal, and this is the semiconductor. Uh, if this is a long capacitor, so if these plates are very large, we expect the electric field within the oxide to be constant. And if we want to relate the electric field then to the energy, and it's unfortunate that they use the same letter, uh, I'll, I'll put a vector notation above the electric field to make it clear which one I'm talking about. We know that the electric field is related to the voltage by just an integral. So if we integrate the electric field, we end up with the voltage. And the energy is just related to the voltage by a minus sign. Or sorry, the, the voltage is also related by a minus sign. But the end result is that we're integrating a constant. So we end up with just a linear function. So a constant times x, a linear function of x. So we expect that this oxide the band of this oxide, the vacuum level, will bend down linearly. So like this. Oh, that's, that's not very linear. Let's try to make that more linear. It'll bend down linearly. And we expect the conduction band and the valence band to follow that because uh, it shouldn't depend on where you are within the oxide as to how it is, how difficult it is to ionize an electron. And so this is the complete band diagram. This is our final result. We've got our we've got our metal on the left, our oxide in the middle, and our semiconductor on the right. And this is qualitatively the entire band diagram. Now, the only question is how much is it bending? So what is the voltage or the 
uh, I prefer to think in voltage because that's what we're used to as electrical engineers. So what is the voltage drop across this oxide? And what is the voltage drop effectively or the total amount of band bending within this semiconductor? And we call this total amount of band bending within the semiconductor phi s or the um, the surface potential. And we call it the surface potential because it's the potential that you see right at the surface, so between the surface and the bulk. Uh, so the surface being the surface between the oxide and the semiconductor. So this is Q phi s. And so all we need to do is relate the, the quantities that we know, so like the work function phi m s, which we know its magnitude is the total amount of band bending. We know that this is just equal to the voltage across the oxide plus the band bending within the semiconductor. In other words, the total amount of band bending is just equal to the band bending in the oxide plus the band bending in the semiconductor. So in the next video, we're going to figure out exactly how much uh, band bending occurs within the oxide and how much occurs within the semiconductor. And then we're going to show that this is directly related to the calculation of the threshold voltage of a MOSFET. So uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.